White Sox fans are just as excited as they could possibly be over the dramatic pennant victory of Al Lopez Men. And what could be my first game in Comiskey Park? My mother was six months pregnant with me, and my dad was able to get upper deck tickets for game one of the 59 World Series. You know, little do I know the White Sox win 11 to nothing and Fuziski has a big game. But little did I know that was gonna become my office one day. My father took me to that first game back in 1956. The most enduring memory of that is walking into the ballpark. Keep in mind, back then, we had black and white television. I'd never seen a ballpark in color. When I walked through, saw the first color, I was astounded. I was shocked. The grass was green, the beautiful scoreboard, and the seats were pretty, and everything was gorgeous. Players were out there warming up, and I, I fell in love with it, and then I loved it the rest of my life. You know, having been there for so many, actually decades, I'd see kids grow up, grandparents pass away, new generations, but that's how close people begin to feel with you. You know, you become a part of their, of the rhythm of, of life. Coming to the old community park, all the sun, you see this monumental. I mean, you, you don't see just a ballpark, you see a, a ballpark with a lot of history. I think everybody was a friend, everybody was a family. The beer vendors, I just, the hot dog vendors, everybody's like, oh, I, I just from Bridgeport, I just from Bridgeport. My, my grandpa used to take me here when he was two. I love it because I, 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 I'm not from Chicago. It treats you a lot of places not from here. You know, they come here playing Leaf. But when you was playing in, in, in the old commission part, it's like, wow, that was you house. It's almost like they wrote us off before we even thrown the first pitch. You weren't going to break us. We, we were going down to the last breath. We have to kill somebody in second base and break their legs. Yes, we want to. We're going to fight. There we go. He's on. I just remember getting out there and going, good God, these guys are huge. This club suddenly, we thought, we had a chance to beat them. When you're playing baseball in a place that you know is special, you didn't take that kind of stuff for granted. People didn't leave the park. They just wanted to stay there and absorb the sights and the smells. Welcome to Comiskey. Check your troubles at the gate. the last game brought my family. We brought our little video camera and I remember talking to a lot of people in the park on my way in. We talked to people that worked at the park and just wanted to capture something so that we'd never forget. Sean, are you gonna miss, are you gonna miss Comiskey Park? Oh yeah. 1990 being the last year, at first it was just like, well, you better just savor every game because this is the last one we'll have at this park. But eventually, the attention turned to, away from the melancholy part to the excitement of a team that just, out of nowhere, was so good. I think if you ask somebody to write a script about the last season at the Great Ball Yard, it might read something like the last season at Comiskey. Nobody expected much from the Sox after three bad seasons. The young players were just now coming on in 1990. From 86 to 89, I don't think we won more than 70 games. And remember, the Cubs were going into the postseason. So everything was on the Cubs. It's almost like they wrote us off before we even, you know, before we even thrown the first pitch. We were a fairly young club overall, especially the, the pitching part of it. A lot, of, a lot of us were, you know, in our first couple of years and just starting out. We were just really excited about the young team that we had building in 89. At the end of the year in 89, I mean, we were pretty competitive. All the media people the end of spring training had us as a last place team and we were pretty aggravated as a club we we knew we were better than that epitomized in the youth that the white sox have brought north with them 11 of the guys on the team right now are 25 years old or less and nine of them are direct products of the white sox farm system the park looked great and i remember being pretty emotional that day because you know it was the last opening day and then they won the game and it was a great way to win, doing the little things. The scoreboard salutes this Sox win on opening day. 
And the White Sox, who had so many problems last year defensively, play errorless ball. Bobby Thigpen out of the bullpen to nail down the victory. Chicago White Sox were trying to keep their fast start intact. Pick it up. Ron Kittle comes up to the plate. And a 450-foot home run. He's 6'4", 220 from Gary. Look at that thing on the roof. Ozzie Guillen hit an RBI in the ninth final 2-1 shot. It really started to become fun because that team, they were exciting. You don't know if the crowds were coming out because they were closing the park or because they were that good, but I think it was a combination of both, and it was fun. And Jeff Torborg was a really, really good manager, and I think he created a, a really tight bond with that whole group. I love to play for Jeff. Best manager I ever played for. I played with Bobby Cox. I played for Tony La Russa, two Hall of Famers. Jeffy was the party guy and loved his player, loved his player. He was the perfect guy for that club. And I'll tell you why. We're a little unbridled. We're a little arrogant. But Torberg wasn't afraid to unleash the enthusiasm as long as it was handled the right way. He wasn't afraid to bring guys in and have a word with them, talk to them about the right way to play the game. He had so much respect for some of the veteran players on the team, and he instilled in them that it was okay to lead on the field, that it was okay to be demonstrative. And for the younger players, it was okay to be emotional with professionalism. Torborg just had a knack for, for getting the most out of it. He was almost like a, a, a dad figure, but in a good way. When your coach says something, just sir. And back then, I think that's what Jeff Torborg did. I'm the boss, but I will let you guys play. That's it. That's simple as that. Well, he just liked to compete. He liked to compete hard and really pushed it for sure. Jeff Torborg understood what it, what it was about, being a major league player. By allowing those young players to fail early, where they realize that an 0 for 4 is not going to cost them a spot in the lineup the next day. How those situations are handled can play a big role in, in a player's career. I'm pitching in, in Detroit. I walk three guys. Then somebody relieved me, got out of it. He pulled me in his office. He goes, hey, I didn't bring you up here to go, you know, needle and round. He goes, throw the ball. I got you up here because you're a fighter. So, man, that meant the world to me. It's like your dad telling you, get out there and giving me free reign to get after it. Jeff would kind of fly by me in the clubhouse and just gave me a lot of encouragement to kind of be who I was and, and not, you know, tell me I had to do certain things or there was boundaries of, to, you know, how to pitch at the major league level. You know, my experience was A ball up to that point. He's like a good, really good family kind of a man. Where we, he, did, he had one thing that was very unique. I don't think anybody else has ever done this. During the season, you know, wives and family cannot fly with you on the team plane for most teams. Torberg said that if you're married, your wife can come with you on the flights. I loved, I loved having that. I loved having uh, my wife come with. It was great. He wanted the team to be family. He, he was smart enough to know that every player is not always going to get along with every other player. Every player doesn't act the same way off the field or on the field, but he still wanted any problems to be taken care of in-house. If you can get that closeness, then you really have something. Let me tell you this about, uh, about that team we had, okay? They did not let me go out at all. You know, and that's what messes up a lot of the guys, you know, when you play in big cities. You play the game and you go out, blah, 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 blah. No. They did not let me do that. I, I love all those guys to death to this day. Ozzy, all of them. They, did, they, they, they made me go home every day. That's, uh, that's love, man. That's love. When we put all uniform on, it was all by the White Sox. Soon I walked to the clubhouse, or we walked to the club, you all my family. A real family, not a fake family. But nowadays, like, I hear people, oh, we are family, we are family. Oh, shit, you can hate each other. I know. You are family when you're winning, but when you're losing, you're like, hey, man, listen, man. no. We are, we was family. We get drunk together, we fight together, and we was there together for everyone. And that's a fact. That's not a, I'm not making that thing up. And nobody going to talk to me about baseball, especially Chicago White Sox baseball. No one. He brings a smile to my face because I remember I was 20 years old the first time I met him. He couldn't speak a word of English 
And let's just step back. So the late Jerry Krause was assigned to find us a shortstop. And Jerry worked with me in the front office on a daily basis to schedule looks on all the top shortstops in the minor leagues. He scouted about 13 guys and spent five to 10 days with almost every player. Jerry came back with five guys that he really isolated with. And we were trying to decide which guy we should go after. And Jerry decided it was Ozzy. He loved his enthusiasm, his instincts. So we make the trade. Roland pulls the trigger, makes a trade that was pretty well ripped by a lot of people. I mean, Lamar Hoyt in 83 won the Cy Young Award. And essentially a year later, he's traded for this, you know, young, unknown shortstop in AAA. He was the centerpiece of the deal, was Ozzy Guillen. All eyes on the south side were on, okay, we just gave up Lamar Hoyt. This Ozzy Guillen guy better be something. Oh, he turned out to be something. And the eight Kirby up, Ozzy's got to hurry, bare hands, yes! What a play by Ozzy Guillen, the only way he's gonna get it. I gave up a rope and I thought, oh, I got to back up second. I turn around to, to go back up second and here's Ozzy Guillen coming up. And he looks at me and says, where are you going? And then he fires the ball to first. And I remember thinking, hey, man, I can pitch into big leagues if these guys are going to stop that stuff all the time. You know, Ozzy was, was always talking all the time. You know, I'd be out on the field, and he'd be talking to the umpire, he'd be, or he'd be talking to, you know, you know, one of the other guys on base or something like that. And I'd be like, Ozzy, you know? I'd be like, because the guy's getting ready to pitch, throw the ball, and and Ozzy's still talking. got his head turned with the umpire. And the next thing you know, the guy hits the ball to him. Ozzy feels it, throws the guy out, and I'm like, I ain't worried about Ozzy anymore. He's he's ready to play. I mean, he doesn't look like he's ready, but he's ready. He was a cut-up, man, and especially on the charter flights, it was so much fun because he just, the guy was a laugh a minute, you know? The only time he wasn't talking is when he was sleeping. And when you're vocal and funny, um, it just puts you more in the spotlight, and I think he took a lot of pressure off a lot of guys a lot of times by, uh, you know, you could see like a reporter in the clubhouse maybe meandering his way over to somebody, and Ozzy would start chirping at the guy to kind of distract him because he knows that player is probably not in position to answer to this guy right now. What they were getting in Ozzy was not just a hard-nosed shortstop. They were getting a leader. And I'm not sure they even realized they were getting that kind of leader when they made the trade. I think the remarkable part of the story is a guy who couldn't speak English when he showed up in 1985, amazingly became a captain five years later. His English was good enough that he could communicate with everybody in the ball club. He was a young man, he was 25, 26 years old, and he was vocal. I don't see guys do what they're supposed to do, at least try. Oh, you want to hear me all game. I'll be a motherfucking all day, every fucking I'm at. Why? I will let you know we care. You don't care, let's us know, and we told Jeff Tobin to get you out of here. And that's 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 what it was. You are leader, you get in people's face, right in his face. He would, you know, tell your brain just just like it is. Even talking to Frank Thomas, I remember him and talking to Frank Thomas, he'd, you know, rip right into Frank Thomas if they, Frank needed to be ripped into about something, he would rip into him. You know, he'd compliment him too, but for, for everybody, he would kind of set everybody straight. I care about Frank. I would care about Frank being good. I care about Robin Ventura to be good. I care about Ventura to be a winner. I care, I care about those guys to be great. Here's the thing, here's the thing you gotta love the Oz. Ozzy talked about everybody. Didn't discriminate one bit. But he talked about himself too. If he saw. You know, so you, you, you got to love somebody that's, that's like that. But Ozzy, Ozzy was pretty much running the clubhouse. Every abat counts. Every bitch counts. I don't see anything, even 2005, I don't see anything like that. No. all the nooks and crannies. So it was this really cool shortcut off the back door of the front office where there was a spiral staircase that took you from the back of the front office down the spiral staircase right into the clubhouse. Well, the club was so small. There's only two toilets. And sometimes, Sundays, some people, they was a little happy. 
but you gotta wait. They put a cage in, but it was up above the clubhouse, and you had to go through the, the spiral staircase to get to it. Batting cage for the Sox was behind third base under the stands. In order to get there, the players had to walk through the crowd. The guys would go up there before the game, get their get their swings in, their flips in. Just an old dusty cage. He went up there and got ready to play. It was awesome to be able to go to that ballpark on a daily basis and and kind of feel like you'd walk from the clubhouse down through the through the tunnel into the dugout and the, the water seeping in through the walls, you know, just because it was underground. Everything was so low, so if you're tall. You had to watch your head because you were going to hit the lights or hit something. Chicken Willie's, our clubhouse manager, his kitchen and his little quarter was underneath, like behind the wall. I mean, you literally, it was like a triangle. It was like a, you had to actually walk sideways to get to where his oven and his stove and uh, just where all of his equipment was. And we'd have ribs, chicken. Black eyed peas, collard greens, fried bologna. Chicken Willie was the best, man. Chicken Willie was, is a legend. Icon, White Sox icon, cooking inside the clubhouse, in his own room. I would go back there in the sixth inning, and I'm saying, like, I'm playing. And I'd go back there, and I would smell him cooking. He called everybody a hamanaga. I don't even know what that word is. But, What's up, hamanaga? And I'd walk back there and look, and I'd say, oh, Willie, he'd have greasy pork chops or hot dogs wrapped in bacon. How bad is that for you? But I'd say, can I get one of them? You know, he'd say, yeah, hamanaga, grab it. Chicken Willie was absolutely the best clubhouse guy you could ever ask for. It's one of the nicest men I ever met in my life. He made that clubhouse, man. There was nobody that worked harder than him. And I couldn't believe the things that that man could carry onto the bus. I mean, he was as strong as a bull. You know what? He was like the heartbeat, to tell you the truth. I was with him in the minor leagues, and he was assistant bus driver. Uh, he was trainer, clubhouse guy. I mean, he did it all. We were in Montgomery, Alabama, and they had a chicken eating contest. This man literally ate 74, 75 pieces of chicken in a certain time, and he beat this other guy. But Willie would take a chicken leg drumstick and just shove it in his mouth, and that thing would come out spotlessly clean. And uh, so that's kind of how he got his name, Chicken Willie. He's from my same hometown. He's from Monticello, Florida. He would write Monticello on my glove. He would write Monticello on my shorts. Every shirt I had, he would write Monticello across because that's the hometown where we're both from. I just remember this infectious smile and laugh that you could hear, you know, especially in the stadium during batting practice. And you could hear Chicken Willie, and he would roam around the stadium, and you could hear him laughing. You could It's almost like a cry. Playing there was like, oh, my God. See the people around you. I started a conversation with the fans. The guys sit there every day with these little girls or little kids. That like the, the guy go Monday, they they don't go for the next three days, four days. Hey, where you guys been? I didn't even see you guys. Let me like a part of a part of the team. You knew you were in a, a classic ballpark that had been around so much tradition. It was a special place. And when you're playing baseball in a place that you know is special, that great players walked, great players stepped in that batter's box, you didn't take that kind of stuff for granted. You just got ready to play every day. The defending world champion, Oakland A's. As expected, atop the American League West, but facing a big challenge from a surprise contender. Until a couple of weeks ago, there was only one ticket window open here on 31st Street with a sign that read, Ring Bell for Service. Thursday afternoon, as the second place White Sox opened the four game series with the first place A's, there were four windows open. At one point, the Lions wound around the corner. We got out to a good start. We had a really good month of May. And I think as a result, we started to realize, hey, we're in second place behind this juggernaut. I mean, one of the greatest teams in the modern era, truly. An elite team with a bunch of Hall of Famers on it. And this club suddenly, we thought we had a chance to beat them. You see Oakland coming to town, and I'll never forget going like on a Friday afternoon to get there right after work, and I'd go sit in the right field upper deck and just listen to the balls bouncing off the roof from Canseco, McGuire, Dave Henderson. And you're like, my God, these were like mammoths, men. I just remember get out, getting out there and going, good God, these guys are huge. 
I mean, you know, Carney Lansford, Mark McGuire, Jose, the smallest guy on the team was bigger than the biggest guy on our team. We play against a great team. We play against unbelievable ball players and compete against Tony. They definitely had the swagger at the time. I mean, they, they were the team to beat. And they came into Chicago and it was pretty intense. It was like, almost like a playoffs. You know, playing in Oakland, it was like playing in the playoffs. Uh, with the, the buzz in the stadium, the stadium is filled up. That first series with the A's, you can feel it. You can feel the atmosphere of a big game. You could feel it in BP, the first game where, hey, this renegade young team kind of thinks we're pretty good. And we're not afraid of you guys. And we're going to come out and we're going to have a really fun time trying to whoop you if we can. What a lot of these young White Sox players don't realize yet is just how wild it can get on the south side when the White Sox are winning. And now it's time to play ball. play it in a real sinister tone. It wasn't this little jingly jangly happy tune. It was like dead, dead, dead. So the whole crowd got into it. And you got 45, 50,000 people in Old Comiskey Park on a summer night. It was like Roman gladiators on the field and they were the Romans. It was just loud and boisterous. And that was our team and it was great. It was great. around up there is where Nancy Faust's organ loft used to be. And that was just great to be able to see her and say hello to her. And Nancy really contributed to the festive atmosphere at Old Comiskey Park. I mean, think about it. She invented na na hey hey goodbye as a see you later to an opponent. She's a Chicago legend. Let's face it, she, she brought so much energy to that ballpark that it's, it's incredible that uh, what she did. Seeing her, even on television, when they used to have shots of her with that you know, she's so beautiful playing that organ. And you just, you just get swept up in the joy of it. I was fortunate to be able to fill in for my mother, who wasn't able to make a job, um, playing at a function that was attended by the general manager of the White Sox. His name was Stu Holcomb. And he, he heard me play, and he liked what he heard. And like the next year, he called me and he said, we'd like to have you, you know, just like that. Well, at first I did what Stuart asked, and he wanted state songs for each player. That was very easy. I then learned a few terms, like when the pitcher was taken out, he was going to the showers. Somebody told me that term. So then I played my rain something. When April showers come your way, I would do something like that. And I think one thing that really reinforced was listening to the radio broadcast my second year when Harry joined the broadcast team. He, if he said something that would trigger a song, like, um, they got to carry me out of here because I'm bored. And I played something like Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. And I remember him saying, well, listen to that. Listen to that organist uh, picking up on that. Who is that person? I ought to bring that person in behind home plate where we can, you know, get to know her. And I felt like I had a whole village working for me. I was probably reinforced by fans that started coming over to visit me, and they'd say, hey, that was clever, how about trying this? Once the game got going, um, people would just come up with great ideas, uh, like slowest player, or somebody's going out with Madonna, or 
a lot of things that I wouldn't have known if it hadn't been for all this feedback. She was very smart with it, and the organ music back in that day was really cool, and she was probably the best one doing it. She brought something that I hadn't experienced at a Blackhawk game or a Cub game. It always felt like, no matter how good they were, you were at a roller rink. Nancy brought something else, though. She was, she was another level. A guy would get picked off first base, and Nancy would start playing the laundry by Dion because he had straight off the base and he got picked up. The first time I'd ever heard that na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na, uh, hey, 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 goodbye, I was shocked. It seemed like it was lack of sportsmanship at first, but then I look around and the fans are into it. They're, they're shouting and they're singing along. You know, that was kind of one of our goals was to knock these pitchers out of the ballpark so we could hear the song. It was so much fun, right? Because you knew when when that started, right, that that we we were doing good. I was there in 77 against Kansas City when the onslaught of home runs and victory by the White Sox led the fans to singing Na Na Hey Hey Goodbye, where they were telling the visiting team so long, you are beaten. Which was perfect for the 77 hitmen because they said goodbye to a lot of baseballs going in the stands and they knocked a lot of pitchers out saying goodbye to those pitchers. The 1977 season just came out of nowhere. There were no expectations going in. Bill Vey came up with the rental player. You know, he signed Gamble, you know, for the one year. He signed Zisk, who had 30 home runs. The Southside Hitmen were very exciting because they hit so many home runs. Back in those days, you know, 31 home runs and Austin Gamble hit to lead the team really meant something because that ballpark was like the Grand Canyon. And so were a lot of other ballparks. All of a sudden, home run after home run after home run. Somehow they managed to, to get into first place and stayed there for about a month and a half. Even though they finished 10 or 12 games behind Kansas City, they still won 90 games. And that was just a huge impact. Every night was like a party. Like Bill Back, when Bill Back owned the team, it was like you had 81 home games and he was throwing 81 parties a year and they were gonna be fun. They didn't win the World Series, but they led the league in home runs and fun that year. Nancy Faust really was surging to the forefront with entertainment. And she really captured that club. I mean, that club, a lot of the excitement was her just getting in a zone where she really knew her role. And that ballpark, that na, 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 hey, hey, that exploded. Somewhere in my 30s, I was realizing I really like the organ. One day it just crystallized for me. The reason why I like the organ so much is because of Nancy Faust. I was raised on the organ going to White Sox games. She was a celebrity, and she never felt like she was a celebrity, even though she was. You know, she always was grounded. Nancy's playing to the player, the situation, you know, the times. Those are unique that you don't have now. The walk-up songs was something I always enjoyed at the old yard. I think my favorite was when Dave Winfield came up. Uh, the Yankees were in town, and he had just signed his big contract. And Nancy played, we're in the money, we're in the money. How appropriate was that? God, I miss that so much. Just the, the organ and, you know, the, the when she did the Harold, Harold. By the way, Dick Al was her favorite player. And when he came up to bat, she would play Jesus Christ Superstar, which is exactly what he was, a superstar. See, this ball club was going to move, but Dick Allen saved the franchise. Remember 1970, they drew 495,000 people. So we all knew Dick Allen was a star. So, okay, what can he do in Chicago? That's a long drive, deep center, way back at my face. It's just it. Hey! Almost into the net. Dick Allen was putting him in the upper deck. He was putting him on the roof. That was the greatest era of White Sox baseball because you had so many more African-Americans wanting to go to White Sox baseball games. 
because Dick Allen showed up. And there was so much pride walking to that ballpark, walking down 35th, crossing over the Dan Ryan Expressway and just seeing all the African-American people coming from the train into the right field stands to see Dick Allen. It was like a parade. It was like, we got a star, we got a star. And Dick Allen was a wonderful person. I know I see him sign autographs. I would always see him hanging out in Lawless Gardens on 35th Street for his big red Cadillac. A lot of times he would be pulling in the ballpark at 7.30. I know Chuck Tanner, I understand, would tell the person, sing the national anthem to stretch it out as long as you can. We gotta wait for Dick to get dressed, but he just got here. Dick Allen may not be the best player to ever play for the Chicago White Sox, but Dick Allen was the most important player ever to play for the Chicago White Sox. Because without Dick Allen, this team would not be here. The team would be in Seattle, because they were gone. He saved the franchise. The best player to play for the White Sox, of course, is Frank Thomas. But the most important player, in my mind, is Dick Allen. Second place Chicago. Go head to head. There'll be more fireworks than the 4th of July. Ricky Henderson and the Oakland Bash Brothers. Ozzy Pudge and the Sox. Be there for the Bash by the Bay. The Sox versus A's. Friday night at 9.30 on Channel 9. It started with McDonald, who wasn't afraid and pitched in and was aggressive. I hit Conseco first, and then McGuire got hit again. He took two steps towards me and pointed number two. Like, you hit two guys already. You know, I'm like, okay, I don't want this guy coming at me. He was huge. And, yeah, if you go back and look, look at where Jose used to set up on the plate. His right elbow used to be literally almost in front of the catcher. So... You know, you throw a ball middle in, and he didn't move out of the way, he was going to get hit anyway, and that's pretty much what happened. The other one, I threw a fastball inside to McGuire, and it, you know, traveled a little bit inside. He didn't get out of the way. It wasn't like I was throwing it, guys. In, out, up, down, back, and forth. That is pitching. You know, if you can cover all sides of it, if you can get a guy in a position where he'll swing in a pitch a little bit off the plate, or jam himself on a pitch inside when he maybe is looking at my splitter outside or looking for a fastball outside, then it's good to go in on him. So, you know, that's sometimes the way it goes. I think they were just trying to intimidate us like they did every other team that year. Once you get a bunch of young guys and all of a sudden they see they can compete with the best in the the league, like it, it starts to snowball from there and just goes on and on and the confidence builds. We all attacked the pitcher that was out there the same way. And the pitchers couldn't, they couldn't like that. We would figure them out and we would all attack them the same way once we got a game plan. I, I don't think a lot of people like uh, like playing us because we never we weren't gonna never quit. If we did lose, you were gonna know that you was in the fight. We were going down to the last breath. fight somebody that they know that they're going to keep coming. You want to fight somebody that you know you can break them. I mean, we used to, we used to beat the brakes off that great Oakland team, man. We used to, I mean, we used to just kill them. We were flying home to Midway, and we came home like at midnight, one in the morning, whatever, something like that. You know, in the middle of the season, and it was, it was like we just clinched or something, you know? It was really, really cool of the fans uh, to do that.
Again, I'll have film before it's over. Yeah. See you later. Yeah.